Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Metaphysical Egypt. Alan Peoples here with Patricia Aoyan Lehman. And this is our 30th episode. Hi, Patricia. Hi, Alan. Today we're going to talk about um, resurrection of the left eye, or basically um, what happens if uh, we have a reversal, a perception of a reversal of the spin of the earth, which basically means it's not, you know, it. It basically means when we're looking at the heavens, everything will revolve in the opposite direction because it, we will have the perception that the earth is spinning in a different direction um, because of a magnetic excursion that turns into a, a flip. Um, seems out there, but we have a lot of information. These are patterns, nature's patterns. Um, and whether this actually happens physically to the earth or whether it's just a pattern of perception, it's a way to understand how we can turn our lives around, how we can turn what's happening in the world or what's happening in our lives if it, it, it no longer serves us, how to turn that around and spin it another way. Um, We've spent a lot of time talking about perception and perceiving movement it is all about perception and i do keep repeating myself it's a journey of perception and even when we look at this first uh slide you know here is toth or jehudi as the baboon mm -hmm. holding the eye out of his heart he you know this is heart-based consciousness so that's implying that of course there's a mind-based consciousness and we've talked about that a lot um and the two hemispheres of the brain um, and, uh, you know, this is, this is huge when we look back in time and there's so many of us, um, researchers out there that speak about how we moved from a, uh, right brain focused, uh, perception of reality into where we're at now, which is a left brain, which is, at, you know, moving from a heart based, intuitive, creative, um, you know, having extrasensory perception into moving into a perception where we're analytical and you know we're, we're trying to wrap you know wrap everything in a little box and tie a string around it and say you know label it and say it's this you know and and give it mathematical and <laughs> geometric ge you know geometrical dimensions so you know it's 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 two different ways of perceiving the world and what i'm doing is relating it to spin and it's because of everything that I've come across in my research of cultures worldwide. So this is what we're going to present today. How does that happen? How do we shift from that? And how do we shift back? Because having that right brain, you know, and, and the key, it's not, a, you know, shifting back is a different way of looking at things. But this is, again, the key is to transmute both, to utilize both the heart and the mind and walk the center path. Um, and I think this is why, as as um, as an Earth-based humanity, I think we have to experience, you know, all both sides in order to transmute and walk that center line and have those moments of complete bliss, you know, moments of complete at one mint atonement, at one mint with all that is before we spin out. Because you know, we're here on purpose. This is this is. This is the hero's journey. So let's get started. <laughs> so you're, you're saying all of the changes that are happening around us to our field of vision, to our earth, to our plane, we could be passive participants just letting it happen to us, or we can consciously take the reins and authority, the responsibility of the creative process and <laughs> build it again. This is, that's exactly what they were doing, Alan. This is what the temples were structured for. This is why they built megalithic monuments worldwide in order to maintain that higher knowing, that higher knowledge. Um, and, you know, the, they had adepts and priests all trained in this. But gradually we forgot, we fell into form, as I like mm. to say, for <laughs> an extreme identification with our bodies as, you know, as being ourselves, instead of that connectedness to all that is. Um, and, you know, this is just a perception of a pattern, but is it all there? Is everything in the temples? Is all of the symbolism and migration of, 
of mythologies there to tell us how to spin it back around the other way. Um, and how to I, control I, it. Well, how to spin it back, and yes, how to control and transmute it. You know, and and you know, all the temples are built with this in mind. They're all built with that that layout of the Sima Tally with you know, both sides, you know, the lotus and the papyrus, the masculine and the feminine, the positive and the negative charge on either side of the center path. We walk the center path and, and we utilize the energy of the structure itself, you know, the subtle energies as it's been laid out for us. And we harness that to, to come into that one, at one moment mm -hmm. um, or that heart or center where heaven meets earth. Um, this is the whole key. So absolutely, it's not about waiting for, you know, procession <laughs> or watching the circumpolar stars, but that is our, literally our formula, um, how we process and how the earth is spinning. This is all an illusion, but the illusion is created by an incredible divine architect that, you know, initiate, initiated this divine pattern for us. Um, and, and today we have, you know, we have a term for it. Joseph Campbell, I think, coined it, you know, the hero's journey. You know, we descend and we ascend. Inanna did it. Osiris did it. In every, all the dogma worldwide and all the mythologies, we have a descent and an ascent. The ascended. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, let's continue because, again, it's easy to talk about these things, but when you see it, expressed in everywhere and in so many different mythologies and symbolism you begin to understand it is the walk the pattern of our expression in this three-dimensional reality um, and maybe it holds the key to how we leave this particular dimension and move into higher dimensions of beingness um, so just follow follow the story <laughs> follow the story exactly perceive the pattern and you rise above it um, the pattern is what holds us hostage, as we've already seen with the net. You know, <laughs> Egypt shows us we're born into the net. We're held hostage by the net the, and the electromagnetic field that surrounds us. You know, but it also gives us the keys to break free and become masters of the net, like oh. Mm -hmm. um, so here we have, you know, according to Egyptian myth, Horus lost his left eye. Now, what's funny is there's so many myths. And again, as you migrate through time, they lose the original knowing. <laughs> and suddenly it's the right eye he loses or both eye he loses. But I believe originally um, Horus loses his left eye. That is the eye of Horus, the left eye, the moon eye, the intuitive eye, the heart-based eye. In a struggle with Seth. The eye was magically restored by Hathor, and this restoration came to symbolize the process of making whole and healing. So what we're talking about today is that re re restoration or resurrection of the left eye that was stolen by Set. What does that mean? Set, again, is the other side of Horus. It's sunset when we move into the, the, the night cycle. You know, age of Taurus, a, a, a way to define it. We we identify with our bodies, that's when we lose all our extrasensory perception, you know, and now we have to rely on five limited senses. That's losing our left eye. That's you when know, we become the fallen angels like we talked exactly. about before. Exactly. Light, liquid light becoming form, set in stone, matter, material world. Um, Toth is the baboon, and here we have, you know, this beautiful baboon holding this eye, the left eye, at his heart, he attempts to make peace between Horus and Set. The eye is rejuvenated and was so powerful it had its own rejuvenation power. Um, and so this is what we're talking about. And what if that's about to happen to us? Because we all waited too long and it's going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we can help initiate the process by, I say it all the time, tearing open our chests and it's, you know, revealing our hearts, our hidden hearts, the thing that we've been so scared to show people, our true selves. It's what we're all seeking, right? We're seeking freedom of expression to be who we are. It's time to do that, to be who we are, to, be, to break free from the illusion, see what's really in front of us, and seek a heart-centered life. I love this quote by Walter Russell. 
Knowledge is cosmic. It does not evolve or unfold in man. Man unfolds to an awareness of it. He mm. gradually discovers it. And that's exactly what you were just saying, Alan. You know, we, we, we shouldn't just sit there and expect it all, the, you know, all the ships to come in and we know we got it, right? Nope. Well, well we, we, we can. It'll happen anyway if you well, we won't to understand not participate. It. Right. Well, if, you, if you we won't. don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, fear is a funny thing. If things start happening and we we fall into patterns of fear, it's going to be a totally different experience. And I think knowing, you know, as we walk through what's about to happen, knowing is the key. You know, peace amidst the chaos. In you know, there's there's a peace in knowing that it's not really happening, and this is the key. Um, it's just an illusion and we can come out the other side, but we're getting to that. <laughs> so here we have, you know, he's juggling the heart and he's walking a tightrope and juggling um, the heart and the mind, you know, the judgment scene, if you will. It's, it's really the heart against the feather. The feather represents the mind. Um, and, you know, does your heart weigh way less than the feather, <laughs> meaning uh, do you have a heavy head? You know, is your consciousness full of um, all the negative things you ever did? <laughs> or is your heart as light as a feather? And, and this is the key. Um, but this is a great um, quote from uh, Plato's Sophist and Statement. Um, there was a time when God directed the revolutions of the world, but at the completion of a certain cycle, he let go. And the world, by a necessity of its nature, turned back and went around the other way. If we're, <laughs> yeah, if we're going to believe in Atlantis, folks, Plato's the one who introduced that, then we might want to take a second look at some of his other um, quotes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for divine things alone are unchangeable, but the earth and heavens, although endowed with many glories, have a body and are therefore liable to per perturbation. In the case of the world, the perturbation is very slight and amounts to only a reversal of motion. For the Lord of moving things is alone self-moved. Neither can piety allow that he goes at one time in one direction and another time in another, or that God has given the universe opposite motions, or that there are two gods, one turning in, in one direction and another in another. But the truth is, that there are two cycles of the world, and in one of them it is governed by an immediate providence and receives life and immortality, and in the other is to let go again and has a reverse action during infinite ages, over and over and over again. It can't be any other way. These are nature's patterns. And he goes on. <laughs> this is translated by Benjamin Joette. This new action is spontaneous and is due to exquisite perfection of balance to the vast size of the universe and to the smallness of the pivot upon which it turns. All changes in the heaven affect the animal world. And this being the greatest, greatest of them is most destructive to men and animals. At the beginning of the cycle, before our own, before our own very few of them had survived. And on this mighty change passed. For their life was reversed like the motion of the world and first of all coming to a stand and then quickly return to youth and beauty. I like that. <laughs> the white locks of the aged became black. The cheeks of the bearded men were restored to their youth and fineness, getting better and better. <laughs> the young men grew softer and smaller and being reduced to the condition of children in mind as well as body began to vanish away and the bodies of those who had died by violence in a few moments underwent a parallel change and disappeared. In that cycle of existence, there was no such thing as the procreation of animals from one another, but they were born of the earth and of, of this our ancestors who came into being immediately after the end of the last cycle. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like the reverse of the rapture <laughs> in exactly. a way. Exactly. It's a reverse all. Oh, it's a reverse cycle. And at the beginning of this have preserved the recollection. Such traditions are often now unduly discredited, and yet they may be proved by internal evidence. For observe how consistent the narrative is. As the old return to youth, so the dead return to life. 
the wheel of their existence having been reversed. They rose again from the earth. A few only were reserved by God for another destiny. Such was the origin of the earth-born men. Fascinating. Wow. And I saw this quote by Rumi, and it seems to fit. This place is a dream. It's an illusion, right? Only a sleeper considers it real. Then death comes like dawn, and you wake up laughing at what you thought was your grief. Everybody should read Rumi. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Rumi is awesome. <laughs> Completely. It's like he totally gets this stuff or got it. <laughs> and thank <laughs> goodness he documented his thoughts um, in poetry. So many of you have heard of Velikovsky, a um, very, very interesting gentleman who wrote some really amazing things mm. um, in Worlds in Collision. Uh, it's all about really, the electric universe. Oh, and so many other things. Um, and I don't discharges think, between charged bodies. Yes. Very uh, he interesting. Talks, he also talks about reversal and the time that the, the Earth stood still. Um, he speaks about Venus as um, collide, having collided with Earth at one time. And this is, uh, this is where I actually, um, I, I don't agree with him on everything. But he does cite a lot of the um, ancient mythologies worldwide. And, and throughout, you know, the next few episodes, I will once in a while quote some of the things that he has um, said in his books. Um, but he in, in the book, he talks about Plato as well. And he wrote in his dialogue. He said Plato wrote in his dialogue, the state, the state, again, the same um, dialogue that I've been talking about. I mean the change in the rising and setting of the sun and the other heavenly bodies, how in those times they used to set in the quarter where they now rise and used to rise where they now set. Well, we've <laughs> talked about this. Yeah. At certain periods, the universe has its present circular motion, and at other periods, it revolves in the reverse direction. I know I'm saying it over and over again, but this this is important. <laughs> um, because and this I, is ancient knowledge. It, this is ancient knowledge. This and the good. Greeks got it from the Egyptians, correct? Hey, you know, I, I, I've shown so much material on this. But again, Horace tells Osiris, at the resurrection, he must turn over before mm -hmm. he can rise. That's reversal. You know, that's just one instance. And, and, and we found so many. Um, when we've talked about them in other episodes, but I've been leading up to, to, to this. Um, and this is why I repeat myself so much because everything ties in together. You know, nothing is just an isolated story all its own. Um, and that's what makes it so hard to write a book um, because it would be, <laughs> would be a several tomes, <laughs> you know, it, 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 yeah, several volumes and, and it would be insane. Um, but another um, Egyptian administrator, Senemut, he was the um, one that uh, everyone believes had an affair with <laughs> Yes, um, he was her vizier and the architect and, yeah, uh, may have been the father of her daughter. Um, but he had the ceiling of his tomb. And, and this is one place I haven't been and would really like to. I, I think now they'll open it for a private permission, but it would be a very special permission. Um, but he had the ceiling of his tomb painted with a stellar array that was in retrograde, fitting a world that had inverted. You know, and everybody scratches their head and say, why? Um, and that, that's a diagram of what you see in his tomb uh, in the upper left. Um, and it's, you know, in the, and there we have, again, you can see um, Horus, uh, a figure, it's a hawk-headed figure, and he's spearing the bull, which is the, um, the, it's the bigger and the little dipper. My, my, think, I, my feeling is it's the little dipper. It has to be Ursa Minor because... The tail of the bowl is on um, the peak. It, it's like the pole star, and that would be the little dipper. Mm -hmm. uh, and there you see Tarette at the bottom, and she, you know, she's got her hands on the um, on the mooring uh, post. On the mooring post, yes, uh, showing spin, and it, this is what it's all about: is spin, and he's showing a reversal of spin. This is important. Um, that's 18th Dynasty. It's a long time ago. Um, well, does that suggest that that's how the sky was at the time of the death of Senenmut, or was this just a depiction showing that this is how it is 
otherwise, you know, from the different. That's my feeling, Alan, that um, I, I don't think it happened then, but then, you know, there are, there are schools of thought that think maybe it happens, you know, four times in a, in a, in a, you know, in a great year. I still believe it happens every 12,000 years. Um, and we have a, a, a less, uh, a, like a, a minor catastrophic event um, every 6,000 years, and then another one every 3,000 years, all representing these moments of vast change on Earth um, as uh, the electromagnetics change as we precess. You know, that again is the her hero's journey. Um, and 6,000 years ago would have been when we, we fell into form in the age of Taurus, so that's a big event. You know, suddenly we see the world one way, devolving into it, but suddenly, you know, we, we lose our connection to everything that is. We lose our extrasensory perception. And, you know, we suddenly start fighting with each other and need, uh, you know, we start to need written and, you know, written and oral language uh, in order to communicate as we move from Gemini into Taurus. Uh, and that's what Tulk represents. So it, it's literally all in the mythologies. It, it's, it's just amazing how they wove this story together for us. Um, and here we're looking at the far right is a picture. Um, I saw this in the uh, the National Museum in New Delhi in India. Um, all the way on the far right is a picture of Surya, which is the sun in uh, the Hindu or the Vedic sun. Um, and I, I looked down at his hands, his arm, you know, the bottoms of his arms from his elbows have been sort of damaging and and fell off or were cut off or whatever. Um, but you can see where they might have come down or you can see there on either side, I saw these dual opposing spins and I think it's representing the, the dual opposing spin, um, really referring to the sun rising in the east or the sun rising in the west because of the change of the earth spin. Um, and I was just blown away by seeing it. Um, and I, I did show you the, the temple where they actually had Surya facing west. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure we did that a few episodes back. Um, that just blew me away when we went into that temple. And, you know, and, and <laughs> the, the, the man that had been researching it for like, you know, 20 to 40 years or something, you know, and he said, why, why do you think he's faced, this is the only temple where he's facing west, and it was where there was a big Lake Lonar, this huge crater lake. Yeah, Lonar, um, right? L-O-N-A-R. Yep, yep, that's it, Lake Lonar, um, and it has magnetical anomalies and everything, and I immediately said, because the sun once rose in the west, and he, he was, he literally was just so <laughs> giddy with happiness and clapping his hands, and, and uh, I looked at Susan and said, see? <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> all right, little sarcasm there. But um, yeah, he said that, you know, in his mind, it was because, the, you know, the meteor had hit and, you know, the Earth stopped revolving and started spinning the other direction. And my opinion is the magnetic field had already weakened or even stopped, you know, to such a, you know, weakened to such a point or stopped. That, that it couldn't deflect the, the meteors. The, well, and, and look what we're seeing now. You know, it seems like our whole solar system is suddenly we're, we're spotting, <laughs> you know, meteors in the sky everywhere. We see these mm. com comets flying everywhere. And, you know, there's going to be another one close to the Earth or the sun's eating them or, you know, I, you know maybe our equipment's better, but I just, I just think it's wild. Um, and, and if you look at charts and graphs, I remember Stella, uh, my friend in Australia, uh, you know, talking to me about that the, the, there were times when we got hit by comets constantly and then suddenly we're not, you know. Some people think it's because of the pyramids, but maybe it's because our magnetic field weakens on a regular mm. basis, you know, every so many, you know, every 12,000 years. Um, and it's weakening now, and we've talked about that too, exponentially uh, weakening. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's big. And, and this also means that we're, we can be hit by a, a lot more solar activity, solar flares, um, and more. And, uh, the, the, you know, the, the solar radiation, this cosmic radiation is affecting us on Earth. So this is all part of this, this uh, pattern and how everything changes on Earth. 
Um, and then, you know, the, 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 the picture in the center is also Surya, but he's holding two lotus flowers um, and basically facing, you know, dual opposing directions. Um, and he's standing on a lotus flower and all symbols of the sun in Egypt and also in India. There are many synchronicities and correlations with Egypt and uh, India. And, mm -hmm. but of course, you know, and it's the same thing with Samaria and, you know, the Babylonian mythologies. It's, it's the same everywhere. Um, there was just a knowing that just suddenly became embedded in mythology and symbolism. And, and each culture put their particular signature on it. Exactly. Um, and that all makes sense because we live at different latitudes and, and whatever, different places on the planet. And each planet gets a different, um, ex, you know, the, 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 the angle of the sun hitting the mm -hmm. earth and changes. And uh, it has something to do with it. Many researchers have talked about this. Um, and so I do have the back-to-back uh, -back lotuses again in the upper right-hand corner there. Uh, left, yeah, left-hand corner. Um, and to me, when I saw it the first time, it, this is an expression, you know, that the sun rises in the east and the west. Uh, because the lotus always follows the path of the sun and it will mm -hmm. never be open at sunset. That's when it would be closing its petals. And uh, we can see here there's two beautifully, you know, <laughs> And that's one of the most ancient symbols that, that, that dates back to the old kingdom or before uh, pre-dynastic times. Um, so, and I love how there's the heart in the center. <laughs> um, so back to Mehet um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the work of Manu uh, Sefzada. <laughs> I have so much trouble with his name and I apologize to him. Sefzada. He's done amazing research um, and I just love to see what he's putting out there. But he brought this uh, pre-dynastic version of um, Tefnut uh, to the foreground along with Robert Schock and a few others. Um, but in this image here, I love this image, you, you can see, um, we see Mehet again and it has that key in his back. Um, and uh, I believe this is, this is the, you know, this is the tool for showing that the spin that it can move in, in either direction. But if you look under that, what looks like a, a sort of strange box in the center, you see two serpents. That's what those little things are. Um, and they're both moving away from center which is interesting. He says, this is a 5,000 year old ceiling showing the lioness Mehet, Egypt's oldest known lioness by name. He calls that key a jaw, by the way, uh, or the jaw sign, guarding the royal administration and archive called Perwur. Perwur is like the place of the, the highest wisdom. Um, and under it, a double headed snake is shown. Um, and uh, Geraldine Pinch says, Mehet was the consort of Anhor or Onirus. Onirus. Well, obviously, that's an earlier name or version, or it even sounds like a Greek name for Osiris, mm -hmm. um, a hunter god who was worshipped in Thinis. Various texts allude to a myth in which Anhor tracks down Mehet in Nubia and brings her to Egypt as his wife. This event is the basis for Anhor's name, which means bring her back to the distance one, distant one. Well, where have we heard that story before? Um, that's the story of Tefnut. <laughs> um, and that's why when I say Mehet is Tefnut and Hakim was, you know, he, he had always said the Sphinx was Tefnut, the spit of Nut. And I think he likes that concept. You know, he, instead of calling uh, the Sphinx Mehet, you know, many names, many different times. Now people think it could be, you know, uh, Kafre or Harvis. Of course, we were in a, you know, a, a patriarchal spin. So, he, you know, the Sphinx even becomes male. Um, but, it, you know, she was at one time Mehet or Tefnut, and uh, she represented the moisture um, aspect of the atmosphere along with Shu, her twin brother. Um, so Geraldine Pinch suggests that the distant goddess may have originally been a personification of the wild deserts of Nubia, whose myth was absorbed into a complex of myths surrounding the Eye of Ra. And that's what I'm talking about. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's all that story, Hathor's Eye. That's why it's Hathor, Tefnut. Um, these, these gods, the names, you know, we put a label on something and we think that container holds, you know, all its information in a neat, tight little box. But the ancients didn't. 
you know, any God can change um, and morph into something else. And Hattor and Tefnut and Sekhmet are all one and the same. Even with Isis, you know, at, at one time, all of the divine feminine are one. And then they, they split out into 180 letters. Um, just to give you, you know, a number because they split out, you know, over time. Um, and uh, the masculine do the same and for a full 360 meters that represent the archetypal energies of every day in a perfect year. And then we have the five meters of Osiris and Horus and Isis and Nebhet and Set representing the extra five days of the year. Their mythology speaks to when we fall out of balance, as we've mm -hmm. said before. And our so, calendar then has five extra days because of being off balance. Exactly, exactly. So again, we're repeating ourselves because it's, I even needed to keep rereading and keep looking at things over and over again to, to understand the connections with everything else. Um, and so, yes, as we were just saying, this is the myth of the solar eye. Um, and uh, in this case, um, Hugen Dietrich, Dietrich um, speaks of the myth in this way. He says it's a nature myth. The cosmic event is reflected in the departure and return of the solar cat, Tefnut, that the sun is lower in the sky in the winter than the summer. The ancient Egyptians assumed that the path they believed the sun to traverse was shifted south in winter, after which it was then shifted back north again in the spring. Now, I think I don't see this. I, I, I think this is a, a, another way of interpreting um the story and making it more about the sun, I think it's more about the flow of the water, Tefnut, the spit, the water, the moisture. The water leaves a lush Egypt and goes south to Nubia and then mm -hmm. reverses this direction and comes back. Um, but Tefnut, daughter of the sun god Re, leaves her homeland of Egypt, goes to Upper Nubia, which was more to the south. But as her at her father's command, she is brought back by Toth, the messenger of the gods, in connection with this mission, Toth takes the form of the monkey and thanks to his eloquence succeeds in accomplishing his difficult task of leading the Ethiopian cat home. Um, his artful play on words, interwoven and amusing and educational sayings forms the core of the mythical story. Um, but what I'm pointing out here is it's again this ebb and flow. And I, I believe there's, you know, if there's a split you know, at the at Tefnut, the Sphinx, that center line, and then everything breathes out into separation and mm -hmm. then comes back again um, in an electromagnetic pattern. This, this is the pattern of Earth. Which is why we always see the two lions facing exactly. away. Exactly. With a, a sphere under their paw, you know. Well, exactly. And here's a beautiful image of Tefnut on the, on the left. Um, and it, she's standing on the current, which has two faces, two heads, <laughs> yesterday and tomorrow, right? Or is she standing on the ancient magnetic equator? Um, and of course, she can reverse direction depending on the spin of the Earth. And that's what this uh, jaw or key on top of Mehet speaks to. And you see the same two serpents in um, that pre-dynastic image to the right. Now these images aren't quite as old. We have the uh, 14th to 13th centuries BC on the, on the left. Look at that image. Um, this is on a golden vase and they, it's called with winged monsters. Um, and uh, it's from Iran, but look what we have, that image, it's a female. If you look closely at the center, it's a female bo body um, and you can see what looked like two breasts or maybe two sons with the lion's heads emerging out of it, the felines. It's a wing mm -hmm. winged feline with two heads, like our double-headed eagle. Um, <laughs> it's fascinating. And of course, the twisted body is showing that it spins and obviously spins in two directions. I mean, it's just beautiful where this symbolism emerges from. Um, and you can see a similar image, but not quite as stylized on the right, of uh, the woman's body and the two felines coming out, you know, with in, in two opposing, you know, two different directions. And you even have the cherubim. Um, so again, are we speaking to, you know, the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> as mm -hmm. you know, we had several podcasts where we spoke, you know, that this Ark of the Covenant is this dynamic of the electromagnetism of the earth. 
you know, it's, it's just expressing everywhere. Um, I love this. You see this image uh, a lot on the papyrus. I took this picture in the uh, Egyptian museum. Um, and you see, uh, you know, <laughs> you see the two ladies, Wajit and Net, uh, and one's wearing the red crown and one is wearing the white crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. And the dual opposing spin of the serpent wave horns in the center. And look at their tails, they're crossing. <laughs> and maybe they spin too. Um, but we're talking about perception, two ways of perceiving the world. It's always perception because we we must remember this is all an illusion. This speaks to it in another way. I've had this this um, posted. Uh, you know, we've talked about this in an earlier episode, but it's again important to remember. We're looking at you know two moments of silence and and you know zero points of reversal. Um, and the whole theme is metamorphosis, the constant change, the hero's journey. The priests of Egypt not only used the scarab as a symbol of regeneration, but also discovered in its habits many analogies to the secret process whereby base metals could be transmuted into gold. Golden age, right? We have all the different silver age, bronze age. You know, we're talking about a journey through, through perceived linear time. In truth, there is no time. There is no space. There's only now. But we have this journey to experience what it's like, to experience different um, dimensions of reality. They saw in the egg of the scarab the seed of, of the metals, and the above figure shows the path of this seed through the various planetary bodies, planetary bodies, because each one rules a metal, until finally reaching the center, it is perfected and then returns again to source. This is, this is what we've been talking about. How do you turn lead into gold? It's the journey of the scarab to earn his wings. It's the journey of Osiris. We're moving through the planetary realm. We're talking about, you know, Saturn rules lead. How do you turn lead into gold? The sun rules gold. It's, it's a journey home. Um, the words in the small spiral at the top read, the spiral progress of the mundane spirit. That would be us. <laughs> After the scarab has wound its way around the spiral to the center of the lower part of the figure, it returns to the upper world along the path bearing the words, return of the spirit to the center of unity. Um, this is getting ourselves back to a lush and beautiful green Egypt. You know, it's Tefnut's journey back home to Zeptepi. Mm. But she is the Sphinx. <laughs> it can't, you know, that is the center of unity the ancient magnetic equator, when everything comes back to center. Um, here we see um, the limestone stella of Penev, 19th dynasty from Dar el Medina. Um, and look at that beautiful serpent. And in the center, you see like a labyrinth and you see the yin yang, right? It's in, he's showing reverence for the yin yang labyrinth of life. Um, you know, and, and, <laughs> It is said, she who loves silence, or beloved of him who makes silence, a local netter, met, merit seeker, guarded the valley of the kings and the village of craftsmen who worked there. Finding our silent center requires an experience of both hemispheres of polarity in life. Um, and underneath, you remember I've been showing you the, the lion, and it says, you know, when the when the violence ended, when the chaos ended, you know, when when all the you know all the the catastrophe, all everything stops. The old lion turns around, and he has a lotus over him, just like we see Merit Singer on the uh, right hand uh, side, lower right hand side. The current turns around. So we're talking about the left eye, the left-hand path. We're talking about spinning another direction where the sun will, will perceive the sun to rise in the west. Um, and I love to point this out because here we're looking at the, uh, the seven classical planets. We have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And why is Venus got a big red circle around her? Because she's the only woman <laughs> represented here, because all of the other ones are represented by 
nail netters, and this is everywhere. You know, it doesn't matter where you are at. These planets are always male, and Venus is female. I think unless you're in the southern hemisphere, and then all bets are off because everything's reversed because <laughs> you're in the other hemisphere. Uh, but Venus is the only of uh, only one out of all these planets that spins. We is perceived to spin in the opposite direction. And I keep saying perceived because there's reasons why we perceive different planets spinning in one in, in a particular direction. Just like the retrograde of, of Mercury, it's not really retrograding, it's our perception because we're moving at different speeds in different places around one central body. Um, and, and we've said this before, think of a wagon wheel going so fast forward that it appears to be spinning in reverse. Exactly. Thank you, Ellen. Because it seems like a hard concept, but it, if you see, you know, and I don't have, you know, the, the visual graphics, but it's, if you see it, it, you know, it's like two different people riding a bike at two different levels. You know, suddenly it'll appear that one is, is moving back, but it's actually ahead because of where it's placed. <coughs> so it's, it's actually an optical illusion? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and I love your phrase because it's all an illusion. <laughs> an optical <laughs> illusion. And that's what we're getting at. But this is very important that Venus is going the other direction because this is what I'm talking about. This is the feminine spin. This is the left eye. This is the matriarchal spin, if you will. And we're talking about you know that right brain focus where we where where we're we're spinning in a way that we're actually connected to the world it's basically unity consciousness versus separation consciousness and suddenly we feel that connection to everything we can feel the subtle energies we have super sensibilities senses we didn't we forgot we had they've become latent within us um, and uh, <laughs> because of what, you know, it's because we have Isis and Nephet, you know, the magnetic field, the veil of forgetfulness surrounding us. But when that veil falls down, all bets are off and, and we have our moments of gnosis. Um, so here I have this graphic, um, which, you know, sort of shows how, you know, one, one planet appears to be spinning one way, which is the Earth and Venus the opposite direction. And if we were to start spinning with Venus, we would actually begin to see the sun rising in the west instead of the east. Wait, hold um, on. If if the reverse spin of Venus is actually an optical illusion, doesn't that mean it's spinning forward so fast that it appears to be spinning backwards slowly? Um, I talked with Susan, our um, um, our friend and colleague who is uh, a world-class geologist, and she seems to think it has to do with, uh, and I can't remember, I don't want to, I don't want to quote her with this, but it has to do with uh, Venus having fallen on its side of it, um, giving us that optical illusion. Um, but it, again, when I just when I just said what I said, that is one possibility that suddenly the Earth starts spinning the opposite direction. But there's another, and I'm going to show you wonderful graphics on this. That when the magnetic field, the two poles of our magnetic field collapse, right, and shift, and there's a pole reversal, what happens is then, in a way, you know, we're all looking up for you know, our, to define who we are from the northern circumpolar stars. But when the magnetic field collapses and then shifts, just like the yin-yang pattern, suddenly it shifts and it's upside down, then consider when that happens that literally our perception, like I was just saying, you know, in the southern hemisphere, they view things in reverse or differently. Their spin, basically, water going down a, a toilet, if you will, spins the other direction. So it is a reversal of spin um, in that sense. And it's a perceptual thing. It's maybe it happens that the earth doesn't actually stop and start spinning the other direction, but it's it sort of as the magnetic field collapses, we perceive everything stopping and spinning in the opposite direction. It's always a journey of perception. 
And she, this is the way she, when she described it this way, it just made so much sense to me, uh, especially with all of the research and everything I've been seeing and knowing that this is all a journey of perception. It's, it, you know, we, we have to stop thinking in terms of actual matter and mass and years and minutes and time and start thinking, you know, remembering that this is all happening as patterns of energy and motion. Um, and our consciousness lies in the magnetic field. That's the biggest key to understanding this. If the magnetic field shifts and 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 you know spins in a different way, then then we might might shift and spin in a different way, you know. So yeah, and and we will talk more about this because there's so much research to support this. Um, it, it's it's really mind blowing. Isn't it true that other planets' magnetic fields are also exponentially weakening? Oh, right now there's a lot happening. Um, and uh, the I think the episode right after this or the one after that, we are going to go deep with everything that's happening right now. Well, the whole solar system, what's happening, what's happened in the past, we, we're going to go deep, and it's big stuff. Um, I'll have a few tidbits in this in this particular episode, but, you know, this is so important because it's going to happen in our lifetime, in my opinion. Maybe, maybe not, but everything seems to point to this all occurring now. Um, and this is what I saw in the temple a decade ago. And at first I was afraid to speak about it, but as I got did more and more research and saw more and more synchronicity, it, it you know, and, and I started to speak about it, then suddenly... You know, I just more and more, I just have folders and folders and folders of information to, to support everything that I'm saying. Um, and maybe it's going to happen within our lifetime. And a lot of researchers out there and, and astrophysicists, and I've talked about Ben Davidson. Um, and, he, you know, people, we'll talk about him later. But, yeah, people, you know, there's a lot of people that, that want to say he, he, he really doesn't know what he's doing. But I've never seen anybody research this stuff more thoroughly than he does. Um, so, yeah, to be continued on, on that topic. Um, but, yes, left ascension, you know, right ascension, Ra. This is what Ra is. <laughs> the name Ra comes from right ascension, right? Um, and if there's a right ascension, well, gosh darn it, there has to be a left ascension, right? Uh, why would you call it right ascension? Um, you would just say ascension of the sun. <laughs> uh, just well, Hakeem used to say things like that. When we label something a certain way, it, it often implies that there is another way. Um, right or clockwise motion is patriarchal, representing the warrior archetype and how we perceive the current daily motion of the sun, stars, and planets. Left-handed or anti-clockwise motion is experienced as a female, balanced Eve. <laughs> Adam and Eve in, <laughs> even mm -hmm. balanced, harmonic spin. Did the Earth spin in the opposite direction during a very ancient matriarchal cycle? Well, obviously, this is what I believe. Um, and it's big. Um, and what's funny is, is, you know, there's different places in Egypt where the women come, and especially I'm thinking of the big black scarab uh, in at Karnak, and they placed it in a different place near the sacred lake. But... The, 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 the locals would come and walk around this scarab, and, and again, seat of consciousness. They would go anti-clockwise seven times if they wanted to become pregnant. You know, this, this is the feminine. This is the creative spin. This is, this is just well known. Um, and here we have this wonderful depiction in the tomb of Ramses the Ninth. Um, and it's basically showing us the sun and sunrise and sunset moments as the scarab beetle descends into the night. And you see this on the right. There is the beetle, seed of consciousness descending, mm -hmm. right? This is wonderful on the right. And it ascends as the crocodile on the left. And the crocodile, and Hakeem was adamant about this, and I've, I've now had so much supportive research on this. The crocodile is digesting matter so we have you know the seed of form we fall into form and then as we ascend or rise our form matter is digested 
as the um, as the sun rises into a new day cycle, night cycle, day cycle. You can see the sun, the crocodile is right over the sun. The sunrise and the sunset. And the, the two, um, boy, I wouldn't even know what to call them behind the, the figure. You can see that have the human heads on top, one's mm -hmm. facing one direction and one's facing the other. You know, you can't miss the details on these. Um, <laughs> just completely fascinating. Again, eternal cycles of transformation. Symbols of Venus. Hmm. Venus is Aphrodite. <laughs> the lovely, the beautiful Aphrodite. Or there even the story of Medusa. Medusa uh, originates as a beautiful, beautiful priestess who uh, were, uh, it was um, working as a priestess in uh, the temple dedicated to Venus, and Poseidon comes up and rapes her, and, <laughs> and Venus, or Aphrodite, gets so upset that she punishes her by turning her into this snake-headed goddess, Medusa, um, and you think, wow, that's so unfair, but if you look beyond the surface story, What's actually happened is what happens when a poor female is victimized by violence and by a violent sexual act, she becomes a Medusa. Look what it does to her consciousness. You know, how many women have been raped and it turns them what? Into monsters. Well, that's hardly a fair <laughs> the way to interpret or experience it either. So it's interesting how this comes to be. Um, it's a reversal of what Venus or Aphrodite represents um, when something like this happens to her. And again, it's also, in my mind, a symbolism of the patriarchy that comes in and hides the, the feminine, the divine feminine heart. Um, mm -hmm. And this speaks to witch hunts that happen worldwide. You know, women no longer in, allowed in, the, in churches, synagogues mosques, um, women not allowed to be, you know, priests at, at one point, you know, one point they are and the next minute, no. Um, and, and suddenly the suppression of the heart itself. And again, my reason for, you know, you need to tear up in your chest because we've all been taught that, you know, emotions are, you know, are, are negative. Don't show your emotions, hide yourself, you know, don't show who you really are. Um, all of these things is the suppression of the divine feminine. Um, and so, you know, when I speak of that rape, it's the rape of this ancient knowing, gnosis, supernatural abilities, um, the healing arts. All of these things are what the divine feminine represented um, as, as that left brain, right brain focus. Um, it, 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 it's, yeah, it, again, Think of the mythology as a metaphor for something much deeper. Um, too sad. And, I, it, and uh, we uh, looked a lot at the chained unicorn symbology before, which is exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. Yep, exactly. It's everywhere. Um, and we tend to compartmentalize everything that we learn as, oh, what a cute little story. Aren't the unicorns cute? <laughs> Weren't those ancient people simple and <laughs> sweet with their... <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's hilarious in a way. Uh, <laughs> the same thing with fairies. You know, fairies are, again, this this knowing, this, you know, this energy that we all once had and suddenly, you know, I would be fairy. <laughs> or... <laughs> But it, it, in a way, that that it all, it, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not judging any of that. It just shows how we lose that knowing, that gnosis. But and we don't lose it. We we hide it in children's fairy tales and the most safest, innocu innocuous places. You know, mm -hmm. where they could right. possibly the most innocent places where they could where you could hide this profound sacred knowledge it's really it's amazing exactly, <laughs> that's exactly right it's hidden in plain sight you know for those with eyes to hear you know eyes to see and ears to hear they will see the truth and i believe this is the time this is the water coming out of the jars of aquarius 
you know, spirit is being released and we're beginning to remember these senses we forgot we had. Um, take a look at this image of Venus or Medusa in the center um, and notice how one eye is wide open and the other eye is shut. Uh, <laughs> again, I think speaking to that left eye, um, uh, just, you know, and again, the dual opposing wave spin, you see the two serpents at the top. Um, and there's two wings behind her. She is not evil. Set is not evil. They're speaking to an, an, uh, a pattern. Um, and of course, you know, the, 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 the dual emotions. This is the feminine energy itself. It's either nurturing or, you know, what happens to a woman scorned? Well, you, you, you hide from her. <laughs> she, she, you know, she's Kali. She's Sekhmet. You know, she is that which will destroy in order to begin again. The fierce rays of the sun. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And that, that, again, is what will usher in the new, the new era, the healing of the earth. Um, and then look again. Look and up. will turn you to stone if you look at it, if you look well, backwards. Well, exactly. <laughs> and of course, the story of Perseus is just amazing because how does he, how is he able to kill Medusa? With a mirror. <laughs> reversal. He has to reverse the image. Yeah. <laughs> no longer function, right? As, as an evil force, she reverses the, he reverses the image. It's just incredible um <laughs> and here we have our swastikas again sorry guys but this is everywhere if you look at medusa she is spinning in the in in, in the right hand way <laughs> um and that's why you know again, her body is a swastika this is the, exactly <laughs> her body is the swastika and it's representing the suppressed feminine this is so important um, and of course, underneath is, you know, in Hinduism, the right facing symbol clockwise is called swastika symbolizing the sun. That's on the bottom with the red swastikas, prosperity and good luck. While the left facing symbol counterclockwise is called the swastika, <laughs> symbolizing night or tantric aspects of Kali. So there you have it. And I love this. I actually took the, both of these images. One was in a museum in Turkey, um, and the other one is in the Sistrum in uh, Istanbul. Um, and if you look, Medusa's head is upside down. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see how angry she looks in the right. Um, and, and my whole theory, she's in the Sistrum, she's in the cave, right, in the waters. And, you know, my whole feeling is we need to get her out of Plato's cave, right? and turn her right side up again. We need to, to, to you know, use that mirror, Atul's mirror, um, and turn this whole dynamic around. Um, and here it is in Ecuador. And if you can see within this um, dual opposing spin, we have the two images of Hathor. These oh, wow. <laughs> I know, I know, you know, I can't make this stuff up. It, it is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the image of the hair is the womb. It's the omega symbol. It's the womb of another dynamic. Mm. Um, and of course, it's spinning in dual opposing directions. This is a Masonic image. I love this. And again, one eye <laughs> is closed. Um, and of course, we have the, the day and the night spins with the eye above. Maybe that's the eye nebula, the um, cat's eye nebula inside the pyramid at the top. Um, and the serpent uh, is Draco, of course, right? Um, this, this is hidden symbolism. And, and, you know, in many Masonic lodges today, they don't even know what this means anymore. Um, and... Uh, it's amazing. I do know that I, I'm, I'm quite certain there are mace, Freemasons out there that do know what all this means. Um, but the knowledge has, you know, we've been losing that knowledge over time in, mm -hmm. in all organizations. Um, check, take a wonderful look at this image, um, this wonderful image. Uh, it's a silver tetradrum depicting the famous Scylla um, in, uh, uh, where is this? Oh, Greek. Greece, of course. I yeah, it must be Greek. Greek. Of course, it's Greek. 
414 BC, uh, posted by Paul Scorpin, who uh, posts a lot of wonderful images. Um, but in Greek mythology, Scylla was a supernatural female creature hmm. with 12 feet, six heads on a long, on long snaky necks, each head having a triple row of shark-like teeth while her loins were girdled by the heads of baying dogs. She was a beautiful naiad who was claimed by Poseidon, but again, by Poseidon, but mm. the jealous naiad um, Amphitrite turned her into a terrible... Wait, that... That's interesting that everyone keeps getting raped by Poseidon. Is that like a tsunami? <laughs> Is that a, a flood from the sea? <laughs> well, it could be, absolutely. Interesting. Well, Poseidon, boy, the depth of water. He lives at the bottom of the ocean. Boy, that, I have to think about that. Interesting. Thank you for bringing that up. Hmm. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Well, no, no, it's good. According to Ovid, the fisherman turned sea god, Glaucus, falls in love with the beautiful Scylla, but again, a sea god, but she is repulsed by his Piscean form. I love this, and flees to a promontory where he cannot follow. This is the Aquarius uh -huh. Leo portal. Oh. She is repulsed by his Piscean form. He's a sea god. <laughs> and flees and it happens at the beginning when we begin to move into the age of aquarius flees to a promontory a higher place where he cannot follow that's turning lead into gold that wow literally is. <laughs> hey <laughs> you know it it, it, it it's there so yeah, um, and of course, a supernatural female creature. This this all comes into play. You know, these are you know supernatural is what we would define it today, but completely natural at one time. Mm -hmm. This is her again, um, and, and you can see that the dual opposing waistband. There are the two dogs, both facing different directions. Is this even uh, relating to uh, Sirius? The dog star. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. The, yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, I just love this image. It's beautiful. And, and what is it but that infinity symbol yeah. <laughs> that I keep posting? Um, and the, the bottom of the two keys of the Vatican symbol, too. You know, it's all. Yep, exactly. It's all recurring. It's all recurring. So in uh, Rory Duff's September 2023 newsletter, I love this. He talks about a special light from the sun. Hmm. And he says, um, we find reference to a special light from the sun that will come as we near the final evolution of consciousness. In the first, it was said that one of the gods of the Inca, Manco Kopak, stepped, in, or Kepak, stepped into this world assisted by a very special ray of light. Shortly afterwards, his brothers and sisters arrived and again assisted by a very special ray of light from the sun. They become known as the illuminated ones. Um, and in another, he speaks but about this, this Sounds like fallen angels again. <laughs> or ascending angels. Mm. Um, but in a second, a Japanese prophecy, it is said that when the goddess comes out of the cave again, mm. a special light will return to the world and the darkest age of humanity will end with the dawning of a new divine light. Well, you know, the, the building texts that Edpo speak about uh, a, a, what, I, in my opinion, is a light or a serpent snaking out of the sun. Um, <laughs> to like the, the kundalini energy coming out of the third eye or of the universe, a essentially. Or a micronova. Yeah. That would be a super flash of light, right? Um, this is from the, re, the, the, the work of Ben Davidson uh, from Suspicious, Suspicious Observers, and he says, the age we live in is coming to an end. In the near future, we most likely will be facing challenges that were foretold to us by the ancients, and I can verify that, within their symbolism and mythologies. Excuse me, the day the sun stood still and civilization is sent back to the Stone Age. It's happened before and may about to happen, maybe about to happen again. Um, I believe we were sent back to the Stone Age the last time, but maybe this time it's going to be something a little different. Um, and this time 
It's not, it, and like I've said before, it doesn't mean suddenly we're in heaven. <laughs> it means we now moving the other direction. That is the, the direction of ascending into that place of what we would define as heaven or complete bliss. So we still have the second half of the journey, um, which is the ascension. But it's a much better journey than the one we've been on, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and I love this. Uh, those of you that are familiar with uh, Dr. Masara Emoto, he's no longer with us, but did amazing work with uh, structuring water. And also there's a researcher, he's um, um, uh, with the University of Washington. Where do I have that? Um, well, I will have that. Anyway, <laughs> he's done amazing work. Uh, he's a professor there, and his book is The Fourth Phase of Water. Um, beyond solid, liquid, or vapor, um, and you know, I, you know, my question is, what if waveform is restructured when consciousness shifts? And this is what we're talking about. So, you know, structured water is molecular restructuring of water involves movement, generates kinetic energy and magnetism. It generates electromagnetic energy. Well, this is what we've been talking about. Restructured water can increase cell recovery through the net energy savings on cellular level. Wow. Hmm. So Dr. Jerry Pollock suggests that, the intention, that intention and various types of energy can have an effect on water. Professor, here he is, Professor of Bioengineering at the University of Washington, Jerry Pollock is an international leader in the field of water research. He received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. In the documentary Water, Konstantin Karatkov states, it became clear that positive and negative human emotions are the strongest element of influence on water. In several experiments, he found that love increases water's energy level and stabilizes the water. Aggressive emotions reduce the energy and make radical changes in the water. Well, what is electromagnetism? It's waveform. Consciousness exists in our magnetic field. And if the waveform itself is restructured based on you know, a, a new spin moving into unity consciousness, then maybe this is how we become stable and balanced. You know what Considering I'm saying? Considering that we're 70 to 80 percent water ourselves. Exactly. This is cymatics. This is, you know, it, it's taking dissension or dissonance, right? Total dissonance or chaos, which mm -hmm. is creating disease within and without, right? disease <laughs> i'm certainly uneasy right now uh <laughs> no i try it i try and walk in peace uh, <laughs> amidst the chaos but if if everything shifts and we we find ourselves moving back into harmonic resonance or ma'at then doesn't that come into play that suddenly we would all become more peaceful um and healthy and vibrant and alive um, it all, you know, it all just, it all just fits perfectly. Um, and again, new ways to consider how we approach life, because if we go out and find our, you know, try and focus on, on creating peace by expressing love, by, by showing these, these wonderful sides to ourselves, then are we shifting the environment around us as well? And, you know, of course that's the case. And again, what you were saying at the beginning, Alan, can we shift everything now? Well, I'm trying to show that, yes, we absolutely can, including our own DNA. Um, an experiment in 2011 by Dr. Luke Montagna fundamentally changed our understanding of how life works. Montagna removed all DNA from test tubes filled with water samples and exposed them to the 7.83 frequency, this is the Schumann frequency. The water which had no DNA produced new molecules even though no life was present. How does that happen? Spontaneous generation. Oh, we were just talking about that. Montana theorized that our DNA communicates via the invisible electromagnetic field that surrounds our living earth and which we are all connected to. If that magnetic field, guys, if that collapses and then we reverse our spin it's spinning in a new way so it's creating a whole new dynamic not only with our electromagnetic field but with our consciousness and with our DNA. 
Oh my God, um, like yeah. every <laughs> creature could look completely different. Exactly, it changes. If we become creators, we can actually express more readily. We do it now, but we don't realize it. But we can literally express spontaneously, spontaneously, however we want to. I can appear as whatever I want. I can appear as an animal if I want to. You know what I mean? Because we have, we are moving, and you know, we have a total different ability to create our reality. Um, but he goes on to say the implications of this research, and I agree, are mind blowing. It seems that the electromagnetic frequency of the Earth not only has a hand in sustaining life here on our planet, but also participates in creating it as well. And so do we. This is the point I want to make. Um, and it's huge. So, <laughs> you know, this this is one you want to stop and really wrap your, your, your heads around because it's showing us how we really do create our reality and how we can change our reality by shifting our own attitudes, changing, reversing our perspectives and our ways of living. Um, huge. Heart-based, mind-based. Masaru Emoto, water is the mirror that has the ability to show us what we cannot see. It is a blueprint for our reality, which can change with a single positive thought. All it takes is faith if you're open to it. Ah, I stumbled across this. Cosmic Gnosis of the left-hand path. <laughs> that would be the left eye. Um, its focus is on awakening the fire snake. Here's our Kundalini, the journey of ascension. You know, whatever is happening without is happening within. Mm. Of Fractal which, patterns. Exactly. <laughs> of which the woman is the human embodiment. Wow. The tantric work of the fire snake or Kundalini simultaneously entails the adept's upward progression along the power zones of the tree of life. In the process, the magician assumes the appropriate God forms associated with the respective zones or sephiroth on the tree. As it turns out, these God forms are usually associated with the animal-headed deities of antiquity. Gee, <laughs> I didn't plan to say what I said before, but it always <laughs> seems to fall into place. In this way, atavisms or pre-human powers manifest in the magician who experiences and actualizes in the astral world the powers and energies possessed by the animals in question. Just fascinating. <laughs> wow. So, from Alistair Crowley, the crossing of the abyss to become a master of the temple by annihilating the ego. Um, and by ego, he means self-absorption. It's, it's literally moving back to that connectedness or unity consciousness. And this is the awakening of the fire snake. So here's the, her the hero's journey. And you see at the top, there's Osiris or you or <laughs> the <laughs> earth or the sun. And it's called to the adventure, right? We've seen the image of Osiris waving back to the matriarchal um, and, and moving out as the fool in the tarot deck into a new expression. So he, he starts the journey and, and uh, he uh, moves through supernatural aid to the threshold of the guardian. So he starts out having knowledge, right? Gnosis. This is Aten, the beginning. And then he falls in the age of Taurus into matter um, and meets all the challenges, right? <laughs> and ramifications of identifying with your body, being held hostage by a belief that you are your body, mm -hmm. a material world, the illusion of form. And then he gets to the very bottom. This is the midnight hour, right? This is the bottom in the underworld, right? And he has to go through the abyss, which is the death and the rebirth, right? The moment of silence, death and the rebirth. This is when he becomes Sokar. And as he comes out of the abyss, and, and this is where we're at now, guys. We're about to enter the abyss. This is when we start going up, the ascension, transformation, atonement, atonement. And then as we rise above that final threshold, it's the return, the gift of the goddess. 
And that's the journey, the hero's journey. Um, and that's the journey we're on in any given moment. This is, this is what we're called to do. Um, and we're in the unknown now. We don't know who we are. We fell through the veil of, of forgetfulness. Um, but we're about to start moving in the other direction. Mm. And I, I hold my ground on that. I love this image of Sobek. <laughs> and it's quite fascinating, and I bring this up for a reason, um, but we see the image on the left. Sobek is carrying and protecting the dead body of Osiris as he swims across the abyss, the Nile, mm -hmm. which is the abyss, right? Flat on his back. But Sobek steps up, and he says, uh, you know, he's going to accept the challenge to carry Osiris across. What do we say the crocodile is? He digests matter. So we're moving through that moment in time when everything reverses. Um, and what's interesting is Sobek, we also see the crocodile on Tarret's back, right? And she, of course, is right up, she's up there. She's the little dipper. She's, you know, she's got Draco on her back. She's, she basically, in my opinion, everybody says she's the little dipper, big dipper. She's Draco. She's part of that big dynamic, the circumpolar spin, um, where we trace our movement through the pole stars um, in a great year. And uh, this is it's, this it's by by fixating on her that we see the movement around her, and that creates our perception of reality. Exactly, um, and that's why I say this event, everything that we're going through, it's happening in the northern circumpolar spin of the stars, mm. as above, so below. Um, there will be that moment when we go through the abyss, when everything stops spinning, and boom. Osiris turn over and rise. A lot of people will connect Tarot and Amit. And Amit, I mean, we've seen the judgment scenes where the heart is weighed against the feather, right? Heart and mind. Um, and Amit is standing there. Now, again, this is a game of the priests. Amit is in the image on the right. Um, and it looks, he has a crocodile head and um, like lion or tiger's feet, you know, front feet, forefeet, and a hippo rear end. Some people say it's another expression of tarot. Listen to what Nanan uh, Y. Schutz says. Is it possible that Amit was created by reversing tarot's composition? After all, their role is likewise inverted. Tarot swallows to give birth, whereas Amit devours to destroy. Is Amit merely a negative aspect of the hippopotamus deity, the reverse of Tarot's coin, or a reversal of spin? Hmm. One creates our illusion of form. She's the great grandmother. She gives birth. She's the one where Anubis comes riding out on the mirror to embalm us in this perception of reality, the electromagnetic uh, field that surrounds us. <laughs> Or oh, when she turns around, the spin becomes Amit, who devours the electromagnetism, right? Takes away the body so that we feel our connect, our reliance on our perception of the body to begin to feel the connectedness and, and unity of all that is. So you're saying it's like Mut and Sekhmet, the two sides exactly. of exactly. the one deity. Exactly. The, and in the heavens, it's a reversal of spin. The creative and the destructive properties it, of the same force. Exactly. And these 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 netters, these these are ancient, probably pre-dynastic, and we find them everywhere. And I believe that, you know, and, and as Hakim always said, that the judgment scene, the way it was translated and described to us was a game of the priests to instill fear and the concept of death and judgment. Hmm. But in truth, it was speaking about something far and deeper. And I believe this is what we're talking about. <laughs> Devouring matter, you know, as we spin the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. as opposed to devouring our souls and we no more of course we all <laughs> live eternally <laughs> there is no death Akeem used to say it all the time you know they, they didn't even have a word for, for physical death it was a moot point it's eternal cycles in two different directions 
Joseph P. Kaufman, I love this. The being who fully realizes their formless nature is no longer fooled by the ever-changing forms of the material world. Mm -hmm. that, that changes everything. You know, when the illusion is gone, when the veil is dropped and we know, no, no more need for words and language. There's no more lying. There's no more fraud. There's no more disease. Everything is revealed and everyone lives in peace and expresses freely. Sounds blissful, doesn't it? Well, I, I mean, I, we've talked about this before that we both sense that it's becoming harder and harder to deceive, to be deceived. Yeah. Yep. People I see through the bullshit a lot easier now. <laughs> well, and especially the, the, the new children that are coming forward. Um, and this has been going on for decades, but the, the kids seem to, to look right. The babies are looking right through us. They seem to know. Um, and we're catching up uh, as adults as the energy shifts. Um, and you're right. Uh, it's so little gets by us you know, anymore. Um, and I think cognitive dissonance is one it, it, is 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 part of that that not that unwillingness to actually look at something for how it is because I, you can't wrap your head around it mm -hmm. couldn't be that right um it can't be as bad as all that or it can be what what you say it is um but in reality anything's possible and this world is an illusion um, and that's the key to remember and if it's an illusion then you can change it in any given moment um, by changing yourself So this is wonderful. I'll, I'll try and read through it quickly. Uh, Hail the Sobek of Shedet. Shedet is Crocodopolis, if anybody's familiar with Fayum Oasis. Um, it's a town in Fayum out in the uh, Western Desert. Um, and uh, open to be the face of Rahis, related to Ra, the, uh, the solar god, the gracious Horus, who is in the midst of Shedet. This is, this is actually showing that Horus and Sobek are one and the same. Horus in the midst of Shedet. Oh, appear Horus upon the rivers, rise high, Sobek who is in Shedet. Ray Horus, mighty God, hail to you, Sobek. Hail to you who rise from the flood. Horus, chief of the two lands, full of bull. So they're speaking about one entity and it's both Sobek and Horus. Great male, Lord of the island lands, Geb has provided you with your sight. The earth has provided you with your sight. He has united you with your eyes, your perception, your knowing. Strong one, your strength is great. May you go through the lake land Fayum, traverse the great green, again, the oceans, the waters, the great floods, and seek out your father Osiris. Now you have found him and made him live and said, this cleans the mouth of the father in, the, in his name of Sokar. Now remember Osiris is us. He's, the, he's us, he's the land, he's the people. You have commanded your children to proceed and care for your father, that is him, Sokar. That's another version of Osiris as Sokar. That's the moment of silence. In their name of carers of Sokar, this is, this is when he's in the abyss. You have pressed upon the mouth of your father, Osiris. You have opened his mouth for him. That's the animated force of life. You are his beloved son. You have saved your father, Osiris. You have protected. May Sobek appear, having rolled the sky, having filled the two lands with his power. The two lands being the two hemispheres of the brain. Be powerful, Sobek, the shed type. More powerful than the gods, as Horus, great of the Weret crown, lord of the slaughter in the mansion of the Red King, said, May you make holy the two lands with your love. Fear of you is greater than that of the gods. May Sobek appear, having repeated births at his coming. This happens over and over and over again. This is the journey through the abyss um, of Osiris becoming the ascended um, Horus. Fascinating. Now, if you didn't know all the little things that I was saying, you would have no idea what this story was about. But it's on, um, I'm going to go quickly to this. That story is at Filet. 
Um, and it's it's in the wall, and it you know it's on the wall, and people look at it, and they you can't even see what's happening, and that's why I included black and white pen and ink. But you're actually seeing that Osiris is being carried across the abyss, you know, um, through the reeds by Sobek, the crocodile, who is also Horus. Mm -hmm. And above that, the new sun is being born because every death is a new beginning. This is the ascension of Horus. And then Isis is off to the far right with the, with the day. So you're looking at a night cycle and day cycle. Um, so <laughs> it's truly an amazing way to express a dynamic. But if you notice within that form, that the Sobek is going one direction and then what's above is happening in the opposite direction. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so again, you know, it's always in the details. And again, this is the re resurrection of the left eye. You can see Horus emerging from the shrine. There's the crocodile on the shrine. There is the eye and there's Horus inside the eye. This is a Kamumbo um, where the healing tools are. And it's, you know, again, the left eye is being resurrected. Um, and, you know, I put the image of Christ on the other side. Again, you know, coming out of the, the shrine or the box, the resurrection, we are leaving the cave, Plato's cave, to see the light of mm. the new day. It's With his new... hands in the composition, of course. Of course. Animation. You, you know, <laughs> it, this, this is coming out of the Sokar moment into a new day. Mm. <laughs> it, it truly is incredible and this is that moment um, and uh, this is creation again the sun rises over the circular mound of creation as goddesses pour out the primeval waters the primordial waters you see the two cobras that uh, Anubis is is riding basically you'll see mm -hmm. these other images um, and right there at the top is the fetish of Osiris that's the head of Osiris at that moment of silence and of course underneath the two feminine netters are pouring out the waters to create the next magnetic field with the eight Agdad with the mares opening a path for the magnetic flow you know the veil that will cover us again for the next part of the journey i rate and it says i raise them from out of the watery abyss out of inactivity so Again, I'm not making it up. It's all here. And I believe that this is where a lot of our, you know, the alternative, you know, everyone out there is teaching these alternative phrases, the new dawn or coming out of the abyss or, you know, heading into, you know, the, the your, your moment of darkness and all the things that we do. And it's all that, you know, it, I, I think it all even comes out of these ancient mythologies. It's worldwide, but in Egypt, I see it because this is where my research is. It's it's there in everything that we're looking at. Um, it, it's <laughs> you know, and 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 these two female netters at the top are holding the shen. You know, these are infinite cycles over right. and over again. It's set tepi all over again, and then the two waters are laid. The dual opposing wave spins that form our next journey of perception into duality with the eight Agdad the eight create. clouds mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly exactly opening a path the mare you know the word for love opening a path for the water to flow for seeding new seeds I took this image on the left at a museum in Turkey. Again, I, Turkey is, is just packed with beautiful, <laughs> so many things that 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 have profound depths of meaning. Um, and this is from the Zugma Museum in Turkey. It's a mosaic, and it's it's basically Hercules, right? The pillars of Hercules. <laughs> but what's fascinating is, of course, there's two serpents. One is descending and one is ascending. Mm. And this is the journey, the hero's journey, right? The journey of Hercules and Osiris are one and the same. Um, it's the descent and ascent of Inanna. It's the Kundalini. It's, the, it's, it's all of these things within and without. And of course, you know, Plato says that Atlantis is beyond the pillars of Hercules. And I, we, we've shown you the imagery that shows that 
in the in the circumpolar stars in the heavens beyond the pillars of Hercules is Vega, right? And it's right. totally which, which was our northern star six thousand years ago, one twelve thousand years ago. Twelve thousand years ago. Exactly. One half of a per processional cycle ago. Exactly. It's exactly opposite Polaris, the depth of polarity. Vega, V, right, related to mm -hmm. love, related to the other hemisphere of the brain. It's the V, Venus, love, you know, all the things related to the divine feminine. This is Atlantis, in my opinion, everywhere. Um, and this is wonderful. This is from the Jane Academy. Um, and in the image, you can see again, uh, <laughs> they have an image here of the uh, cobra making the sine wave path between the two hemispheres of the brain. And it says, with the activation of the pineal gland, the third eye is open and seemingly supernatural powers are released. They're not supernatural, folks. We have them. We forgot we had them. Um, the diadem crown symbolizes this new level of consciousness with the cobra's tail uniting the two hemispheres of the brain. Yeah, and I saw this, you know, I've been teaching this for years and I've never seen it in print anywhere. And I just saw this uh, like last month and I thought, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the cobra and the vulture together indicate the two functions of intellect, intellect and intuition working together. So, yes, it's not just me saying this. <laughs> Um, so that is, sometimes I wonder, I'm totally off my rocker here. Um, Sobek is the Egyptian crocodile god in ancient uh, initiation rituals. An advanced student had their third eye or pineal gland rubbed with oil from the fat of crocodiles. Oh, that sounds quite fun. Hmm. Proclaiming an ancestral connection to Sobek's star home, which is the constellation of Draco, the great serpent. With his, this third eye activated, the initiate wears a diadem crown or headdress that is adorned with a culver, symbolizing a new level of consciousness. The culver's tail unites the two hemispheres of the brain. The culver also has the wings of a vulture, indicating that both intellect and intuition are working together, that universal intelligence crowns their lives. This ancient story is the same story being played out today in our world politics, and also the story or battle towards our own personal inner resurrection. So again, you know, how many times do we have to see the same thing? It, it just makes perfect sense. And vultures, by the way, um, eat carrion or dead bodies matter. <laughs> Digestion of the physical. Um, this image comes from Nefertari's tomb in uh, on the West Bank in the Valley of the Queens in uh, Luxor. Um, and people always ask what it is. And the minute I saw it, you know, look at the culvers going two different directions. Um, and these are eyes. They are images of the contained eye in dual opposing expressions, mind and heart-based consciousness. Again, I've always said it's a journey of perception. <laughs> Um, and Rory Duff says, going further out into the cosmos still, we can include the great galactic cycles with even bigger regular effects on human consciousness. It is with this that we can now begin to see how roughly every 12,000 years, we find human consciousness changing from individual consciousness to group consciousness and back again, just as Rudolf Steiner had so brilliantly managed to find out. Um, and yes, uh, Rudolf Steiner is another one who speaks to all of these things. Um, it's just wonderful material that he puts out. And uh, both Alan and I love Rory Duff. Um, he, he, again, I found him by chance and he speaks, he speaks our language, right? Hmm. Here we have another expression of, the, of Tarette. And in the center, and it's a hard image to see, they're in the process of cleaning these chambers at the Temple of Dendera. But this is Tarret. Um, in the center image, Tarret is on the left, and Winit is on the right. And Winit um, is a rabbit, Netter. And she represents the Southern Pole, the South Pole. And notice how she has, uh, um, underneath, on the far right, she has a shaft of wheat. And this relates her to Virgo in a way. Mm. Um, and I have some imagery I'm going to show you quickly in a moment. 
But Tarot is holding the seat of consciousness, and it's almost like a handoff. Tarot is with the northern circumpolar stars. The scarab. Exactly. Did I, what did I say? The seat of consciousness, but it's a, a scarab it's, beetle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Yes, uh, <laughs> representing the seed, seed of consciousness. And it's she's in the northern circumpolar stars. Winnie is in the southern circumpolar stars. And it's the handoff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. It's that moment. And this is right next to that image of Geb um, head over heels, mm -hmm. the earth's turning head over heels. Which we um, just talked about in the last episode. Exactly. It's in the same chamber. Um, and it's it's this moment in time when everything changes. Um, so yeah, um, Winnie is the swift one. First form was that of a serpent, representing fertility and currency. Um, the hare and the snake played a role in the circle of life and renewal. She was associated with the underworld, the southern hemisphere. Winnie was the patron netter of Hermopolis, having ruled the chaos in the primordial waters. And of course, the Sa that Tarot leans on is the Analima, which is this wonderful spin in the heavens that speaks to this dynamic. It teaches us that none of this is permanent and that we are always given a chance to begin again. Sometimes, like the movement of the sun, we may not notice these moments. They may appear to be so subtle that their arrival is only noticed by our unconscious minds. Unless we are aware that it's happening and then we can walk through it with knowing. Um, mm -hmm. But the secret, oh, sorry, go ahead, Alan. Nothing, go ahead. Oh, your best. But the secret of the ancients was that time is cyclical and that the end is found at the beginning and is the most noticeable from a place of stillness, a fixed self that can become aware of the cycles of the planet, the stars, and when we are ready, the soul. Um, and the analema again, is if you were to take a picture of the sun or even the moon at the same time, every day or every night, it forms this wonderful infinity symbol in the heavens. And it also marks our solstices and our equinoxes. Um, and the top part is basically the pot of gold. It's the summer months where Leo is. Well, it's actually, it's like, it's not a perfect infinity symbol. It's more like a bowling pin shape where the top of it is smaller than the bottom part. Well, it is, but it all depends on where, what latitude you're at. And sometimes you don't see the full infinity symbol. Sometimes it falls oh. below the horizon, and that's when it becomes the star. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, it's, okay. It's, I didn't know that. Thank you. Well, I use this picture because it shows the beauty of the infinity symbol. But, but it didn't like, occur to me that it would look different depending on where on Earth you're observing it. Uh, everything does, strangely enough. Hmm. <laughs> Everything does, but it's the same. This is the dynamic of our perception in every breath of life, and we have right. all this symbolism to show us. Um, you know, again, you know, the caduceus, the, the two snakes, the negative and the positive charge, uh, dual opposing wave spin. This is it. This is this is being in a three dimensional reality. It's all about currency and spin, as we've said over and over again. Here is uh, Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. Um, and <laughs> so many things we can talk about here, but I, I really don't want to do that. Um, but I use the blue line to show us where the center is. And you can see that Jesus is to the uh, right here of the center line. And we actually have what, what, what in some pictures of the Last Supper would be um, John the Baptist, here is clearly a woman um, representing Mary Magdalene. Um, and together they form this wonderful V of Venus. And she is on the left side. Um, and I believe John is on that side as well. But it, it all represents, again, these, uh, all of the dynamics, you know, all of the 12 disciples represent different zodiac signs. and. You know, it all comes together to speak about these dynamics mm. um, that we've been talking about. And um, I love this um, uh, quote, or yeah, fr from Nikki Rowe, um, the wild woman embodiment. I believe this is her image as well. The feminine are the portals to forgotten knowledge, to ancient energy, medicine, creation, and recalibrating the soul back to its original source. 
It's everything I've been saying. Um, yeah, the awakening of the left eye. Left ascension, La, Lakshmi, <laughs> in India. The path to wisdom and purity. Um, there's a Leo Virgo connection, uh, right? Uh, we, we, we point to Leo, you know, the, the rule by the sun in gold and move into Virgo. The lion and the virgin constitute the great astrological mystery of the zodiacal sign called the Sphinx, um, both Leo and Virgo together. And I'm gonna tell you why in a minute. Um, but again, left ascension. The lotus represents knowledge and self-realization. Uh, it's a flower that blossoms in cleaner, dirty water as a symbol for purity and beauty, regardless of the good or bad circumstance in which it grows. Huh. That's where we're headed, folks. <laughs> and you notice she's she's uh, releasing coins into a container filled with gold. <laughs> Um, this is this is literally the moment we we move back to uh, you know we've turned lead into gold and uh, we move back into unity consciousness and regain our supernatural um, our extrasensory perception and there you know by clockwork there's my <laughs> there's my serpent and my lion after the destruction of the old lion turned around come on guys it can't be any other way. Um, this is called the labyrinth, Labyrus, um, and it's found in ancient Minoan depictions of the mother goddess. Its symbolism is related to the moon and the labyrinth, and is believed to be that that, me, that the meaning of the word labyrinth is the house of the double axe, um, and it was used by female priestesses only for bull sacrifices. Um, and again, digestion of the physical. The bull represents the material world, um, and so. <laughs> Uh, it is believed to have been used in the battlefields by by the Amazons, and that's the the, the warrior god uh, women, <laughs> making it a symbol associated with female empowerment until today. And these are this is the same symbol as the back to back lotuses. And notice there's even little swastikas inside um, that image. Um, and it's it, you know this is this is at Kalash Temple, and you know it doesn't it, it, if you look at this there's these lions, there's four lions with the center, basically the birthing box in the center, right? That's the pivotal point, right? The mooring post even. And you can see that all these different lotuses that they're standing on and almost imagine them going in different spins. Mm -hmm. um, and if you notice, there's two lions facing each other on the east and two lions facing each other on the west. Um, and it almost looks like, you know, you can almost imagine again, this, the same dynamic of going back and forth, yin yang, spins, um, and again from Manu, um, this is this is great. This image he posted it. Unis has come from the island of fire. Unis or Winis. This, this this is actually from um, his pyramid at Saqqara. And this is what the text is saying. He has come from the island of fire. He has given it order in place of chaos. Unus for the linen is guarded by forehead cobras. He's earned his cobras. It is the darkness of the great flood that comes forth from the great one. Unus appears as Nefertum, as the lotus at the nose of Ray, who comes forth from the horizon every day cycle. Nefertum, the harmony of the atom, as opposed to Atum, when we fall into duality. Um, <laughs> it's great. Um, so yeah, this is this is really amazing. And here is my wonderful image of Nefertum. And you see, like the, the baboon, he's holding the eye of consciousness, um, showing at his heart, showing heart-based consciousness from within. This is the harmony of the you know the the the, the feminine spin. Um, the lotus has changed direction and flourishes. Um, Sekhmet and give birth to Nefertune after the destruction. The same understanding. Okay, this is so cool. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. We're gonna talk, continue with the Leo Virgo connection. And what's really interested, interesting is, you know, I just did a podcast with David Matheson and um, Ksenia Moore, uh, his partner. Uh, we're gonna be doing a tour together next year, but we did, um, we all we all three talked about this interesting this this 
dynamic that just happened in the beginning of September, which was the uh, Haleakal rising of Regulus. Um, and, uh, you know, Ksenia said that, you know, they wanted to talk about it along with many other things that we talked about. So I, I did some research and it, you know, it's like all of this stuff came forward, you know, and some of it I knew and some of it was like, wow, this is so cool. This is so cool, folks. Um, because this is Leo in the, in the heavens and Regulus is actually um, known to be the heart of the lion. It's the lion's heart itself. And, and, you know, I've always wondered about this particular dynamic. But what's interesting is the head of the lion forms what they call, it's, it's a backwards question mark, but what it really is, it's called the sickle. And what do we relate the sickle to but the grim reaper, right? The harvest, mm -hmm. right? The harvest. You know, when we think harvest of souls, oh, no, it's death. It's not death. The harvest is everything we've worked for on the hero's journey. And, of course, the devouring of matter, that's the prize. You know, to feel that connectedness to all that is, is to not be veiled anymore, but to be part of the currency, to understand and feel all the subtle energy. Um, that wow, that's so interesting. I mean, you're, you're relating that to the, the sickle, the harvesting of the wheat, for instance. Exactly. Which is the um, symbol of Virgo. And then it's the, Which is right in front of this, right? She's holding the shaft of wheat. And this is the whole dynamic that I have been speaking about, the heart of the lion and Virgo. This is where we're heading. This is the goal. This is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, <laughs> so, yes, uh, Regulus is part of the sickle of Leo. It's a sickle-shaped asterism that represents the head of the celestial lion. It appears as a backward question mark, like I just said. Um, but, it, you know, Regulus was also known by the Arabic um, name Kab el Asad, the Greek name Cardia Leontos, and the Latin Cor Leonis, all meaning the heart of a lion. Lion's heart. Richard the lion hearted. Hmm. Anyway, here's another image, and you can see again, this is the lion's heart. It was, Regulus was also one of the four royal stars of Persia, along with, uh, I'm not going to name them all, well, Pomohat. Antares, Aldebaran, and the bright stars in the constellation of Isis Austrinus, the southern fish. Scorpius the scorpion and Taurus the bull. These stars were considered to be the guardians of the sky in ancient Persia around the year 3000 BC. Um, in Persian astronomy, the sky was divided into four districts, and each district was guarded by one of the four bright stars. Um, so again, marking different seasons in Persia. There's more to that story, um, but the, the Persians really focused on this particular dynamic. Um, and what I related to is the Golden Gate, what we've been talking about, you know, the key that opens the Golden Gate and the Riddle of the Sphinx. And I saw this wonderful quote by Philip Lindsay um, uh, from Esoteric Astrology. And he writes, the mystery of the Sphinx connected with the relation of Leo and Virgo and tied up with the secret of solar angels. This is not the mystery of soul and form, but the mystery of the higher and the lower mind in, and their relation to each other. See, everything we've been talking about, Virgo and Leo together stand for the whole man, for the God man, as well as for spirit matter. It's important to have this in mind for when the nature of the world is revealed, then the mystery of the Sphinx will no longer exist. This is the moment we're talking about. This all happens. We're on the precipice of that moment when we move from the formless realm into the form, the form realm, into the physical realm, into the formless realm, and we understand everything that this amazing Sphinx, this pre-dynastic, megalithic monument represents um, within this dynamic. Um, and <laughs> I had said they were restoring the chambers in Dendera, and I took this wonderful image that you can see now in all its beauty, and it's marking this moment in time, and I just love it. Because on this birthing box, you have, you know, the, it's basically the lion, the, sphin the sphinx, in the rec reclining position. And behind him, you have Horus, you know, he's basically there protecting this moment in the abyss, right? This is that moment of stillness. 
And above that, you see the hieroglyph for linear eternity. So it's now coming out of the silence into another expression of linear, you know, with it, when we, we perceive linearity with the birth of the new sun. And that's Virgo, Isis, right in front. So right. there, there you have your lion's heart with the birth of the new sun. Um, Sitting on the throne holding the new Horus. Exactly. This is the birth of the new sun. And of course, this this dynamic, it, it, I mean, it's just so beautiful. Um, and we showed this before, but you know, wow. So here we have, <laughs> I've added a little bit to it because remember I said that this, this little figure, this bull headed figure was Horus the bull as Saturn, right? Well, he's holding the sickle. And you can see the bull Saturn. Uh, that's from the one I have in the upper right hand corner is the bull of Saturn, which is Horus the bull of Saturn. Um, downstairs in the in the first of the style hall, but here we're looking at the Dendera zodiac, and in this one corner where you see Leo looking back, and there I have the heart of Regulus, the sickle right at front, and then if you look above, there is Isis with the sheaf of wheat, sheaf of mm -hmm. wheat as Virgo. So here is your dynamic. Um, and the Leo is looking back with his feet on a symbol for Aquarius. Here is that moment again, as we were talking about, you know, this is that moment in time when we move to the heart, lion's heart, to the heart-based focus or right brain focus of um, perception. Isn't that cool? Wow. <laughs> He's holding a sickle. <laughs> I love it. Now Saturn, well, oh. Saturn, Saturn, well, <laughs> Saturn is Satan, Set, who is the Grim Reaper, right? But this is Set, Saturn here would represent um, Aquarius, again, because Aquarius uh, is ruled by Saturn, which rules lead, and Leo is the gold. So the same dynamic, it's showing you that there's a, a portal right there. Okay, so this is fantastic. Look on the right. This is a um, Masonic image. And here you see uh, an image of an angel behind Virgo, right? That would be Isis, of course, holding that sheaf of, uh, of wheat or whatever. And the angel is holding the sickle. <laughs> so again, we see that connection. Um, and what I understand is is all the Masonic temples are have this image of Virgo and uh, Regulus High. Um, you know they, they utilize this image and the focus in all their temples, um, and and even that the White House itself in Washington D.C. is aligned with Virgo and Regulus at certain cycles in the heavens, right above right above the White House. So interesting little dynamics here that this is a moment to be um, to be remembered or you know to 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 hold it means something and of course this is what I'm trying to express but what's fascinating in, in the image on the left also here, here we have our eye in the sky again in that moment in, of centeredness and then on either side we see you know, on the left side, you see the warrior, the Amazon, basically, um, dynamic of the divine feminine. And the men are, it's almost like they're kneeling and looking up and, you know, with a, a sort of reverence for the, the feminine. And on the left hand side, you see the woman half naked. And it does, it seems like even the men, you know, they're standing and they seem a little angry or, or more reserved. It just seems, you know, it has a different expression or emotion to it. Um, and uh, below you see on, the, on that particular side, you see a globe of the earth. And on the other side, you see the beehive representing the womb of ninth. Um, and again, the primordial waters, the divine, you know, uh, feminine. And the bees, of course, the queen bee uses magnetism to um, uh, subconsciously control or keep the world order among the worker bees. Mm -hmm. um, so two different dynamics on either side of that image in the center representing uh, Virgo. 
Um, but what's also interesting is this is, again, a moment of harvest and digestion of the physical. As you can see on the right, the pillars of Boaz and Joachim are basically falling down, right? So duality is collapsing and mm. we're moving into unity consciousness. Wow. So here we see again, there's an image of Virgo in the heavens. Um, you can see her below. This is on the right, you know, holding uh, holding the wheat in one hand and uh, looks like a plant in the other. Um, and there I have Juanita again. <laughs> um, and above uh, the image downstairs and uh, at Dendera again in the first Hepistyle Hall, here's the image in the center top where, where Isis is holding that wheat again. And she is Virgo, and behind her you have um, Regulus with the sickle um, oh. and the bull. So <laughs> <laughs> there you have it again, that same dynamic. And I also um, press put up this image. We've seen it many times, but this image when we're born into form, and Hathor's head, her chin is sitting on those pillars of Boaz and Joachim. So the two dynamics: one is digestion of the physical, and the other is we're born into diaphanous. Uh, duality into form as the face of Hathor. Um, so yeah, two different spins as expressed at Dendera. And at some point, we're going to do a whole podcast on Dendera. Well, maybe five <laughs> or more because there's so much there. Um, but here again, here is Set holding the sickle. Um, and you and I speak about this a lot. Set uh, is where we get this name uh, for Satan. Or the devil, which spelled backwards is lived, right? Um, but this is um, from Heliopolis, and you see Set is holding the sickle, or what ancient Egyptians called the kopesh, and it meant stre strength. It also was the foreleg of an animal. Oh, mm. <laughs> could that be our our bull's leg in the heavens, the the little dipper? <laughs> but of course. It's all happening in the heavens, the marking um, this journey that we're on. Um, other names were sickle sword or bowed sword, and I have a, an image of it there for you at the top on the right. Um, it's basically marking this moment when light contained in form is released, right? And the thing is, Lucifer or Satan was, you know, Lucifer meant light bringer or dawn bringer. And that's what we've been talking about, the birth or dawn of a new sun, of a new cycle. It's the new dawn. You know, we, we talk about, we say these things all the time, but they, they come from something, you know, much deeper. Now I have the uh, Masonic image of Lucifer in the center on the bottom and it, boy, he looks nasty, right? He looks like the devil, right? As it's been described to us. And again, I'll say a game of the priests, you know, turn something that is beautiful into something that is ugly, um, that we can be afraid of. But what if it's just as, as, you know, like I said before, I asked Hakeem, you know, you know, was that evil right? or someone in our group asked him and he, he said, he just smiled and a twinkle in his eye. And he said, it depends on which way you're looking, which way you're spinning, right? Um, allow the light out of the container and it's not the chaos is dead it's over it's digested um, and the light is free to express however it wants that is the fallen angel that is resurrected um, <laughs> it's huge um, and the image there on the bottom on the right is an image of um, it's obviously set in his heavenly donkey form um, and of course, the donkey is a beast of burden because once that light is implanted in physical form, it is, it's basically held prisoner. Um, we are beasts of burden, aren't we? We have to survive. We have to work to survive. Um, but look at this image because I've talked about this dynamic. There you have the ta, and he's, you know, this is the waset. So here's that image in the center again. And at the bottom is the waset, right? The scepter, the wasp scepter, and that is the image of Set. And you can see above, if you cut the face that's looking at you in half, you have two wasp, wasp scepters, right, <laughs> facing inward. Um, and that wasp scepter is Set being placed in form. It's liquid light becoming form. And you can see this in the image of the top. 
You can see he's wrapped in his own wings and he's holding an ankh. And through the womb of the ankh is the, 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 the wasp scepter goes through that womb into the body, the spine of the jet pillar. And that's set locked in form. That's chaos, that's liquid light wanting freedom again. Um, and again, if you look to the far left, we have the Masonic skirt, what's been come to be known as the Masonic skirt as it was portrayed in ancient Egypt. And if you look closely, you can see that skirt sort of goes out in front of him. <laughs> and then you can't see because we're looking at it sideways, but it forms like a, a triangle or pyramid in the front. But what we're looking at, if you look at the very point, we have that face of set, like facing forward again. And what this actually means, and it's been expressed to mean this, is we're looking at the very nose, the point is that point, that zero point. And that is the sun in the day cycle spreading out into all those different rays of light, all the matters, all the archetypal rays of the breath of life as rays of the sun are liquid light becoming form. Um, and that is the expression of set. So how can that be evil? Um, so here is another wonderful image. Again, we can see uh, Regulus holding the sickle with Virgo. Um, and um, this is by Adam Goldman and it's initiation and our esoteric second births. The initiations of Freemasonry like church, ba church baptisms in the evangelical community where the phrase born again is in common use, are second births intended to replicate the births from our biological mothers. From our very first steps in masonry, we find ourselves in darkness to emulate our nine months of darkness in utero. That's in Plato's cave, mm -hmm. immersed in amniotic fluid, right? Flood. And when the water breaks, the flood, we are ushered through the birth canal the vaginal west gate, so to speak, still connected to our mother's umbilical cord. In masonry, we call it the cable toe, while the alchemical book of Genesis bellows from the east gate, right? We're talking about the rising of the sun mm. with the aid of, aid of a duala. Our darkness eventually gives way to light and a thundering clap, right? And that's the slap that creates the breath of Ra or the sine wave. This is the slap. Patricia had a power cut in Cairo, so we couldn't finish the day we were recording, but now we're back. All right. And so that ends another episode. Um, and uh, here I'm introducing a new tour that we're going to host. I'll be hosting with uh, David Matheson who uh, you might know, he's the expert in star myths um, and mythologies. And I've spoken, spoken about him in our podcast and his partner, Ksenia Moore, who is a, um, a, a brilliant astrologer as well. And uh, we're gonna do a wonderful tour called Stars Over Egypt. So if you're interested in coming and learning about the cycles and the stars and how all of the netters play into the movement of the stars in the heaven as above, so below. Um, please take a look at uh, my website and uh, maybe you'll want to join us next year in November. Awesome. Thanks, Patricia. Our website is HorusRising.com. And please like, share and subscribe. And we'll be back with more very soon. Thanks. Thank you.